welcome. Tonight, another massive flood claimed 33 lives in Jigawa State, causing extensive damage and destruction as several people across 14 local government areas of the state are rendered homeless. Ahead of school resumption across the nation next month, Chief of Defense Staff General Christopher Musa calls for synergy among security agencies, community members and managers to prevent attacks on schools. Minister of Women Affairs advocates for increased recruitment of more women in the military to pave way for greater gender equality within the top brass of the nation's armed forces. An Italian authority is investigating the death of seven people on a luxury yacht in Sicily say they are looking into potential crimes of shipwreck and manslaughter. Now on business news, Federal Minister of Tourism unveils draft national policy for the sector as part of government's efforts to further revitalize the industry. And on sports news, Paralympics torch begins journey at England's Toke Mandeville, the birthplace of the Games. Jigawa State, which has now recorded 33 deaths from the flooding in 14 local government areas. The Minister of Defense, Mr. Badaru Abubakar, disclosed this when he visited Governor Umar Namadi of Jigawa State to condole with him over the incident. The governor told the minister that a lot of residents who have been displaced from their homes are now living in temporary shelters. Our correspondent, Sadiq Ilyasu, has this report. <laughs> Seven days of heavy rainfall have thrown thousands of people into disarray in most parts of Jigawa State. Thousands of families are now homeless as water inundates their homes and farmlands. We now live in a school building. We are now like beggars. We have lost our rice, southern beans, farms to the flood. Meanwhile, the Minister of Defense, Mr. Badr Abu Bakr, is in the state to commiserate with the state government over the disaster. The minister, who is the immediate past governor of the state, provides update on the impact of the flood. Over 1,148 communities were affected. 7,500 households affected. Over 50,000 people affected. And about 11,500 farmlands affected also. While we lost 33 indigents of the state as a result of this affliction. Governor Umar Numadi is grateful for the gesture and announces the donation of 20 million naira to victims of the disaster. I am sure so many people in Abuja who have also sympathizing with the museum also condoning with what is happening in Jigawa State. So this situation is for all of us. But you still decided we hear this end. But only to allow us also donate us some money about 20 million per hour. May Allah reward you most abundantly. The state government is expecting more relief materials for the victims, especially from the federal government. Sadiq Inyasu, Channel Television News. To security matters now, the Chief of Defense Staff, General Christopher Musa, has called for collective measures amongst security agencies, community members and school managers to protect schools from attacks. General Musa, who was represented at an event, made a call at a safe school workshop with the theme, providing a secure and safe learning environment for advancement of national development, organized by the 8th Division of the Nigerian Army in Sokoto. He said the armed forces of Nigeria will continue to do all within their strength to ensure the protection of children in collaboration with other security agencies. Emergency 
and we work with him. The Nigerian army is complementing the efforts of the Safe School Initiative by organizing this workshop for security agencies, community members, and school managers as part of the federal government's policy on safe, secure, and violent free schools initiative. While the Defence Headquarters is pledging to do all that is necessary to ensure safety of schools, the armed forces are calling for a collaborative approach to tackling the challenge. The Safe School Program entails collaboration among the security agencies as well as civil societies to secure, to secure schools across Nigeria for our children to attend. It is clear that to secure, to secure schools in the state, all hands must be on deck. The idea of the step-down training is that participants will educate others in their formations, educational circles and departments to expand the scope of their knowledge. Like you are aware, the National Safe School Program is a federal government agenda and the whole idea is to give our children a conducive learning environment. The Defense Headquarters being interested in the program of the federal government first did the national workshop in Abuja. The idea of this workshop is to further bring it down to the level of all formations and units. We've done at the national headquarters in Abuja, but we feel that our units all over the country will need to understand the role they have to play in supporting other agencies, in collaboration with other agencies to ensure that our schools are safe. What I want to assure you is the caliber of people that you've seen here and also with the assurance of Chief of Defense staff, I'm sure this is something that uh, the outcome will be better than how it is before. Motorcycles and communication gadgets were presented to agencies and school communities to contribute to the safety of the schools. More women in the military. That's what the Minister of Women Affairs is advocating for to pave way for greater gender equality within the top brass of the armed forces in line with the national gender equality policy. Mrs. Iju Kennedy Ohaneye made the request during an advocacy visit to the Nigerian Defense Academy in Kaduna State. She's also asking for a 35% admission slot for female cadets into the academy. The Minister of Women Affairs, Mrs. Uju Kennedy Ohaneye, inspects a guard of honor upon arriving the headquarters of the Nigerian Defense Academy in Kaduna State. The minister is visiting the academy as part of her advocacy for gender equity. I am here to encourage you. I am here to let you know that out there, in a short while, you people will be very happy as far as God keeps Mr. President alive so that I will be allowed to work. According to the academy, women currently make up only about 1% of senior ranks and about 10% of total personnel of the Nigerian Armed Forces. Nevertheless, the NDA Commandant Major General John Ochai is committing to fostering an inclusive and equitable environment in the academy. The Nigerian Defense Academy is proud to be at the forefront of equality, inclusiveness and diversity in our nation. We recognize that the military has traditionally been a male-dominated institution, but we are committed to changing this narrative. The revolution in military affairs offers a wide range of skill sets in the application of military power. And we believe that women have a critical role to play in this revolution. To commemorate her one year in office, the minister donates sanitary pads. She also had interactions with the female cadets, urging them to focus on realizing their full potentials. I am so satisfied, but I'm Oliver Twist. I'm asking for more. I'm still asking for 35% affirmative. But so far, I applaud Ami. I am so happy. Look at them. Just take a look at the innocent faces I am seeing here. And I can, I can assure you, any day there are commanders somewhere, of which I've heard some of them are already, you will see a huge difference. Remember, the men are our children, so they're not wiser than us. <laughs> we still respect them as the men. But when it comes to being firmer and, and stricter, 
the women are there to give you that. The Academy and the Ministry agree to foster a strategic partnership to ensure gender mainstreaming in the Nigerian military. The Deputy Governor of Niger State, Mr. Yakubu Gaba, is appealing to the federal government to redeploy the army to Alawa community in Shiroro Local Government Council, which has been overrun by armed bandits. The appeal comes on the heels of the recent killing of 13 farmers in the community by suspected bandits. He made the appeal during a visit to the community to condole with the families of the farmers who were killed recently. This is Kuta Community, the headquarters of Shiroro Local Government Area of Niger State. This community provides temporary shelter for hundreds of displaced persons who were sacked from communities by armed bandits. The recent bandit attack in Alawa community in the same local government claimed the lives of 13 farmers who were on their farms. Shamshia Yahaya's brother was among those killed in the attack. She had previously lost her father in a similar attack five years ago and had to flee their community to an IDP camp. So, say you make a chit to a far for the man who was so why any. Say I go far for the woman soon at the one. Say I go to man. Yara so. Say the chiba come. Say the kira mama na. Say the kisa the matter the chwa. Yen zaba muda uba. Say no kwa ba muda yaya. Kya kare kya kare kya mana. Kuma kya ni abundo karom. Allah uba ni kya kana miki ni zongwa na. The Deputy Governor of Niger State is here to commiserate with families of victims of the recent attack. He appeals to the federal government to consider redeployment of military personnel to the community. The Baji people are not lazy, we are not coward. Actually, if we have the weapon, we can confront those people. But as a law abiding citizen, we cannot carry weapon. Therefore, we want to appeal to the military and other security agencies to see reason to go back to Alawa so that they can give a full uh, they, they, they can give full cover to our people so that they can go back to their farms. The withdrawal of military personnel from the community five months ago seems to have rendered the area unsafe and a prompt response to the state government's appeal could just be an immediate solution to this problem which is already taking its toll on farmers and other residents. Still on security matters, the Northwest Operation Hadarin Daji has introduced a new toll-free emergency line for the residents of Castino State to ensure their safety. The newly launched toll-free line is also part of its comprehensive strategy to combat banditry within and beyond its area of operation. A statement signed by the Assistant Director, Public Relations 17 Brigade, Casino State, has asked residents to make responsible use of the toll-free line 08000002202, that's 08000002202, which is now available for emergency complaints and distress calls. It emphasized that timely and accurate reporting can play a crucial role in the fight against banditry, adding that the OPHD is committed to leveraging on new strategies to restore peace and security across the region. In part two after the break, Edo APC takes campaign for the September 21st governorship election to Ipobaoha local government area. That's in a moment. Join us again. Welcome back. If you just joined us, you're watching the news at 10 live on channel television. A reminder of our top stories. Another massive flood claims 33 lives in Jigawa State, causing extensive damage and destruction. The Director General of the National Intelligence Agency, Ahmed Rufai Abubakar, has tendered his resignation to the President. 
Minister of Women Affairs advocates for increased recruitment of more women into the military to pave way for greater gender balance within the top cadre of the nation's armed forces. An Italian authority is investigating the deaths of seven people in the sinking of a luxury yacht in Sicily, say they are looking into potential crimes of shipwreck and manslaughter. The Director General of the National Intelligence Agency, Mr. Ahmed Rufai Abubakar, has tendered his resignation to President Bola Tinubu. He disclosed this to State House correspondents after a meeting with the President today. Citing personal family issues as one of the reasons for his departure, the security boss said President Tinubu has accepted and approved his resignation. It's a routine thing um, from time to time to brief Mr. Pre President uh, on situations, on issues, and uh, today is no, uh, 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 it's no exception. Uh, after the briefing, actually, I tendered my resignation, and Mr. President graciously approved and accepted the resignation. I thanked him uh, for giving me the opportunity uh, to serve Nigeria under his transformational leadership um, for a period, for an extended period of 15 months, which is very rare, by the way, uh, to serve, to have the opportunity to serve uh, two presidents at a stretch, at a goal. So I thanked him very well, and I promise to remain professionally, as we professionally dedicated to our country and to noble causes. There are quite a number of reasons one will do that, some personal family issues, but nothing very serious actually. And uh, uh, the friendship will continue. Um, I discussed with Mr. President, he understood very well, and uh, I promise to remain seized with issues and the security situations of the country. I've had uh, the opportunity to mentor uh, officers and the staff um, for all the period that I've been DG. This is the seventh year, by the way, and the opportunity to mentor younger officers to come up. To politics now, the All Progressives Congress, APC, has reminded the police to ensure that individuals carrying arms under the guise of security are relieved of them before the Edo governorship election. A former governor and senator Adams Oshomole made this known today during the APC campaign rally in Ipubaoha local government area. Former deputy governor of Edo State to come and speak to this. Even though it's the weekend, members and supporters of the APC again turn up for the party's campaign rally in Benin City, the Edo State capital. This time on an expanse of land on Sukumba Road in Ipubaoha local government area. We are going to make this very brief. The campaign team says the party has a record of good governance from the past and believes this is one reason the citizens can count on its candidates for development. So today you're coming here as boss, has activated us to work more as never before to win this coming election come on the 21st of September so that together we will bring the desired development to our local government. All of you from today go to your various units and mobilize more. We are still going to do tour, unit tour next week by the grace of God. So all of you, after our leaders, we will still talk to you people about what to do. <laughs> the former national chairman of our party, Senator Adam Aliu Oshobaba. A former governor of Edo State, Adam Sushomale, draws the attention of the Nigeria Police Force to an issue he considers of utmost importance. I had meeting with our security agencies. What the police need, what DSS need, is not like the guys who are not even properly paid, carry dangerous weapons in communities and on highway in the neighbor of Edo, ESA, they call it, Edo Security Network. But we are reminding the Commissioner of Police at the eve of election, we are for ballot papers. We are not for bullet. They must withdraw all those 
who are not members of the Nigerian Armed Forces, namely the Army, the Police, the Navy, and the Air Force. The candidates briefly outlined their manifesto. I put in something in the budget through NHIA to enroll minimum of 15,000 of their citizens for universal health coverage. Myself and my principal, we are going to make good laws that will promote and support economic growth of our dear state. We are going to bring education back. We are going to we are going to employ in the next the first 100 days in the office. We should be having 5,000 teachers employed into our schools. Do you have water in this town? Power water. We do not have it. So we are going to get our water back. As the meeting closes, the supporters are encouraged to take the campaign beyond this rally and all around their spheres of influence. Other stories now. A former business lawyer and life bencher, Mr. George Etomi, has asked the Minister of Justice and Attorney General of the Federation, Senior Advocate of Nigeria, Latif Fabimi, to ensure an immediate audit of Nigeria's international obligations. He made this call against the background of the recent moves by a Chinese firm to take over several assets belonging to Nigeria abroad. In an interview with our judiciary correspondent Sholashi Mr. Itomi says the federal government may also need to begin to withhold the allocation of states who enter into contracts that have adverse effects on the country. I, I, I recall the last conversation, one of the last conversations, yeah, you, we, you'd ask me the question, uh, agenda something for the new Attorney General, and I did say that we should do an audit of all these international obligations. How many more of these, the PNID type, this Songfo type, are in the woodworks, we're either not aware of, or that can spring a surprise to us? that call is even more important today. Then, secondly, we should begin to limit the ability of subnationals to drag the federal government into their own matters. The federal government should be a bit more circumspect in what they guarantee and what they don't guarantee. And when you begin to put yourself on the line, then make sure you ensure that if that state stays on the, on the straight and narrow, even if you begin to hold some part of its allocations to satisfy the potential of these sort of surprises coming at you. Now, what's attachable and what's not attachable? As I mentioned earlier on, if you have an asset that's used purely for state purposes, like your embassy building, like in this case, the presidential plane, which was why it was released, um, they could prove that it was exclusively for the use of and uh, for, for 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 the of the president. Um, it can help. So it just calls for us to be overall more diligent as a country. We can't continue with this careless and um, somewhat irresponsible attitude to international obligations. The Federal Ministry of Education has marked its one-year anniversary under the leadership of Professor Tahir Maman, reporting what he calls significant achievements, including the provision of about 40,000 facilities nationwide and the enrollment of about 4 million out-of-school children for basic education. At a briefing in Abuja, the Minister of Education, Professor Tahir Mama, noted the completion of a unified data system, the training of over 85,000 educators, amongst other accomplishments. He also mentioned plans to meet with the leadership of the Academic Staff Union of Universities, ASU, next week. Our correspondent, Benny Ark, has this report. <laughs> The Federal Ministry of Education marked its one year anniversary with a ceremony at its headquarters in Abuja. The event was attended by the Honorable Minister of Education, the Permanent Secretary, and other ministry officials. In his address, the minister highlighted some of the ministry's achievements. We've been able to turn, bring back to school about 4 million 
young children through the data which NYC has about 21,684 students are parading fake certificates from Benin Republic obtained between 2019 to 2023. Togo, about 1,105. He then outlined the ministry's roadmap for the future, focusing on key areas such as data repository, out-of-school children education, teacher training and development, and skills acquisition and development. Before we came in, we had a data of about 30 million learners at the various levels of secondary school. The data we have now is about 55 million. Enrollment has improved from 30 million plus to 55 million plus. Every administration and head take issues about agreement or that agreement or the other with ASU, with ASU, with ASU, with COESU, you know. So uh, we are going to, we have already invited them for a meeting on Monday. Uh, in the afternoon, and then we have written out to various ministries that have something to do with their complaints to draw their attention to it. Looking ahead, the ministry says it plans to upgrade the education management information system, construct 50 integrated senior secondary schools, and integrate 3.5 million Amajuri and out of school children into the formal school system. Benny Ark, Channels Television News. Still ahead on the news at 10, Federal Ministry of Tourism unveils draft national policy for the sector as part of government's efforts to further revitalize the industry. That's on business news. Do join us again. Welcome back. In Yobe State, residents of Gaydam, a border community with Niger Republic, say they have recorded significant increase in the number of school children this year. The Education Secretary of Gaydam Local Government Area, Mr. Saleh Mustafa, told Channels Television that the massive construction of classes, supply of furniture and manpower motivated the enrollment after a relative peace from the Boko Haram insurgency. This is Gaydam, a border community and one of the epicenters of Boko Haram insurgency. Rich in economic activities, Gaydam has faced significant educational setbacks due to the ongoing conflict. Peace is gradually returning to the area. According to government officials, there has been a significant improvement in school enrollment, especially at Scafella Primary and Junior Secondary School, thanks to substantial infrastructural development. Most of our schools has been occupied by buildings, and the procurement of furniture has been done in almost all the classes within the local government area. If we may recall, during the inauguration of His Excellency, the Executive Governor of Obe, Obe State, in 29 May 2019, he has declared a state of emergency in education sector. As such, he has established more schools, and the in, uh, enrollment has been increased. And he, as a result of the establishment of more schools, the congested school has been decongested. The chairman of the Gaydam School-Based Management Committee has refuted claims from a viral social media video alleging the Kafela Primary and Junior Secondary School lacks classrooms and infrastructure. He is requesting that the government provide perimeter fencing for the schools. Our major problem here is uh, uh, like we, we are having some trespasses in the school and that is largely taking mind of uh, uh, the students from effective teaching and learning so we are our concern here is we need all the school to be fenced even though they are fenced but the wall is short now we need them to be a uh, little bit uh, the, even with two blocks or with wire everywhere and we have 
problem of that men. All the schools are open. Everybody will enter and will go out at any given time. And there is even my school that we got a lot of stolen items there. It, this, the place is turning to like a ghetto area. The issue of sending all the classes and other infrastructure in the Capella Primary School is burned down by insurgency. It's not true. All the insurgents happen, they are not affected any primary school. It's only affected uh, Mary's Aloma Polytechnic. And here the eye is seen. You can see this infrastructure, classes, and new buildings, even the upstairs buildings. We have the much infrastructure. The only problem of this institution is overpopulated of the students. This is the only institution. As far as I'm concerned, the area is conducive for learning. And we thank the Yobe State government for contributing a lot to upgrading and developing these institutions. This expert also notes that the school and its environment are now suitable for learning activities, a significant improvement compared to their condition before Governor Mai Malabuni's administration. Initially, uh, when we talk about the enrollment here in Gaidam, uh, we encounter a lot of heat due to the problem of this insurgency. But after the insurgency, the state government, in its effort uh, to uh, cover up the problem encountered. They build a lot of structures in our primary schools, particularly this primary school where we are in and the mega school built by the state government. Yobe, a state struggling with insecurity and high rates of out-of-school children, Residents are hopeful that Governor Maima Labuni's declaration of a state of emergency on education will yield positive results in the near future. The First Lady, Senator Uluremi Tinumbu, has dispersed a 50 million economic empowerment grant to a thousand female traders in Kaduna State under her Renewed Hope Empowerment Initiative. Speaking at the distribution of the grants to the beneficiaries, the First Lady, represented by the wife of the Deputy Senate President, Leila Jubin Baru, says the gesture, which is being implemented across the 36 states and the Federal Capital Territory, is aimed at empowering women who form the backbone of the family. The Kaduna State Government has also applauded the First Lady's empowerment program, which is in line with its commitment to bring millions of women out of poverty. Traders from the 23 local government areas of Kaduna State gathered at the Umar Musa Yarodua Conference Center for the flag off of the Renewed Hope Empowerment, an initiative of the First Lady, Senator Oluremi Tunubu, to empower 1,000 market women with recapitalization grants of 50,000 naira each. The First Lady is represented by the wife of the Deputy Senate President, Mrs. Leila Jibrin Barao, who says the gesture is part of the 1.8 billion Naira grant set aside for 37,000 petty traders across the country. We are all aware of the challenges faced by small and medium enterprises, especially our petty traders who form the backbone of our local economies. Through the Renewed Hope Initiative Economic Empowerment Program, we are providing 1,000 pre-selected women petty traders per state with a grant of 50,000 Naira each to recapitalize and grow their businesses. A total of 1,850,000,000 Naira will be dispersed to 37,000 women petty traders across the nation. The grant is meant to assist the traders to overcome some of their business challenges and expand their businesses. And the Kaduna State Government has a policy of ensuring equal opportunities for women. We are today sowing the seed of the economic empowerment of our women. Today's event will have a trickle-down effect. When you empower a woman, you empower a family. The economic empowerment of women is a key priority of our administration. We have been given soft loans to women to expand their micro-businesses. 
our administration recognizes the strategic place of ICT in driving economic growth and improving the lives of citizens. The initiative is considered strategic by the First Lady, who believes the effort will uplift families and prosper the Nigerian society. About 3,700 operators of micro, small and medium enterprises in River State have benefited from the third batch of the NGCARES COVID-19 Economic Recovery Fund by the federal government. This was revealed at the launch in Port Harcourt, where the River State government emphasized this commitment to be transparent in the handling of all counterpart and intervention funds aimed at easing the suffering of residents. This hall in Port Harcourt is filled to capacity with operators of micro, small and medium enterprises in River State. They are here for the registration and launch of the third tranche of the NG Cares Fund disbursement. NG Cares is a federal government COVID-19 action recovery and economic stimulus initiative in partnership with the World Bank and the state governments. For this purpose, 135 billion Naira was shared nationwide to expand access to good livelihood, support food security and vulnerable people and firms. The River State Government received its share of 19 billion Naira and the government is paying it out to businesses across the state. At the inception of this program, the target was 2,700 for the period. But as I speak with you today, we have surpassed that by 1,000. And we are targeting, we have, we, today as of today, we are 3,700. The government feel that the hardship and the difficulty that is being experienced in the country today, what he needs to do in River State is to see the best to alleviate it. And that's why he has deployed the sum of 19 billion naira back into River State in terms of alleviating poverty. And this money is being delivered on three resort areas. One is the area of agriculture. Two is the area of direct cash transfer, and three is the, in the area of small and medium scale enterprises sub loan. That's the one we are launching today. The state government is also launching a portal to enhance interactivity for the NG Cares in addition to a separate 4 billion naira counterpart fund for the Bank of Industry. Just as the registration to benefiting from the program was easy, we also expect that each and everyone who passed through that process should find it seamless registered into the portal. So the portal provides an opportunity for the state to have a database of whatever business anybody is transacting in the state. is seamless. Well, the NGK program is very particular about the gender women. In fact, we were told that more percentage of beneficiaries should be from the women gender. So, yes, for the Reef Care Studios, there are three programs. We have even affected more women than men. Apart from the fund disbursement to approved business owners, various business startup packs, including computers, printers, and other essential tools are also presented to beneficiaries during the two-day events to further encourage their entrepreneurial endeavors. By the time the money comes in and we start using it, we can install solar panels. We can even put uh, cameras in the shop, put um, uh, a financial um, a lab, like things like laptops, point of sale, so we can monitor the growth of the business. Now we can also add more counters in the business for more uh, sales girls to, you know, involve the business. So the business will be flowing more. More customers will be attended to very quickly. The MSME portal and the NG Rift Cares funds are expected to play a crucial role in driving economic growth and sustainability in River State providing businesses with the resources, support and opportunities they need to thrive. Relief may soon come the way of residents and motorists plying their Bell Hotel to Lagos Expressway as the Ogun State Governor, Dakwa Biodun, has officially flagged off the reconstruction of the 81-kilometer road. At a ceremony held in Iwikuru local government area, Governor Biodun reiterated his commitment towards critical infrastructure development in the state for social, economic growth and development. The 81.6 kilometer road is a federal road and a major arterial road linking four local government areas in Ogun State and Alimosha local government in Lagos State and has been a subject of discussion amongst those who ply it as a result of its deplorable condition. Residents here say the road has been abandoned for over 20 years. 
with its attendant negative effects on socio-economic movement of goods and services and well-being of the people. It appears that soccer might have come as Governor Dakwa Biodun turned the sod and officially flagged off the reconstruction process with men and equipment mobilized to site. Today, we are celebrating you and we are thanking God for your life. Who has played it in your heart that this world could not remain like this? Yes, it's a federal government rule. Uh, they don't write it on anybody there that you are from Odin or from anywhere. You are sure what you have preceded us over the years as we seem to do. To do. The State Commissioner for Works and Infrastructure, who is represented by the Permanent Secretary in the Ministry, explains that the road is divided into five sections for reconstruction, as the contractor seeks the support and understanding of host communities. The significance of this project, not just to Ugon and to the Lagos states, with the project terminating at the Abune Egg Park Bridge, but it's economic significance to the trade and commerce of Nigeria as a whole cannot be overemphasized. What a feat that the goals and hearing of this project is actualized today. Addressing supporters, residents, traditional rulers, community leaders, members of the State House of Assembly and those of the State Executive Council, Governor Dabwa Biodun expresses gratitude to the federal government for giving the state approval for the reconstruction of the road. With speeches over, the governor leads other dignitaries to turn the sod and officially flagged off the road reconstruction. Let's find out what's happening in the world of business. Willie Bong has details. Thank you, Melinda. The Federal Minister of Tourism has virtually presented the draft National Tourism Policy, the event which was held in collaboration with the, National, with the Nigerian Economic Summit Group, NESG, and other key stakeholders witnessed participation from top government officials, private sector representatives, and key industry stakeholders. In a key note address, the Minister of Tourism, Lola Dejan, highlighted the strategic focus on sustainable tourism, community engagement, and diversification of tourism products as essential pillars that would drive economic growth, job creation, and cultural preservation in Nigeria. The draft policy addresses critical areas such as digital transformation, sectoral synergies with aviation, immigration, and education, and resilience building against global challenges. It is expected to be finalized by October with a presentation to the Federal Executive Council scheduled for November. Nigeria's foreign exchange reserves declined for the third consecutive week as the gross reserves level weakened by $63.5 million week on week to $36.44 billion as at August the 22nd. The latest drop in the country's external buffers, which comes despite the CBN's FX retail auction, is largely due to persistent demand pressures, which caused the Naira to trade with high volatility during the week. The external reserves have recorded a marginal decline of 1.16% or $430 million in the last two weeks since the Central Bank of Nigeria reintroduced the retail Dutch auction in the FX market. Also, foreign exchange trading at the FMDQ closed negative this week as the total turnover of forex transactions 
Caridol fell by $814.17 million as of August the 23rd. This amount represents a 10.29% week-on-week decrease against the $907.53 million recorded last week. According to the FMDQ, the week-on-week decline in total turnover was largely driven by the 9.29% flop in FX spot turnover. At the same time, the FX derivative segment of the market recorded 84.14%, or that's about $10.13 million decrease which was solely driven by the drop in the FX forward segment. Elsewhere on the forex market, the Naira depreciated by 0.76% to 1,597 cover against the dollar at the NAFEX window. In contrast, 1,578 Naira 54 cover recorded in the previous week. Elsewhere, trading at the equities market ended the third trading week of August in the red as sell pressures, particularly on shares of Dangote Cement took toll on the overall performance. The market's benchmark all share index dropped by 1.16%, while the total value of listed equities fell by marginally uh, 2.45%, 2.45 billion naira due to the impact of losses from the industrial goods sector of the NGX, and that countered the significant gains from the oil and gas sector as well as the banking counter. At the same time, the activity chart a mixed performance there as the total volume of transactions rose by 177.1%, value was down by about 21.9%, while the number of deals carried out this week was lower at 42,006. In price performance, the shares of RT Briscoe topped the list of 43 gainers with a 59.41% advance. Qtix led the 33 other losers with 37.37% price decline while the trio of Standard Insurance, J.E.'s Bank, and G.T. Co. were the top three most actively traded stocks for the week. And for the NASD OTC securities market, it ended the week strongly positive as the index climbed by 8.05% week on week, to, while the overall market value rose to 2.19 trillion naira. However, the volume of securities traded this week did by more than 86%. Value traded fell more than 57%, while the number of deals carried out and stocks traded ended negative. Aradell Holdings, Central Securities Clearing System, and Afriland Properties were the top three gainers. Priceland Campina and Food Concept and Mass Telecom Innovation were the three decliners, while Joe Fluids was the most traded security on the NESD exchange for the week. Now let's bring you some of the expectations for Nigeria and the global financial market next week. And we start off with the National Bureau of Statistics, which is expected to release the country's second quarter gross domestic product GDP report next week. The MBS is also expected to release the July FAC disbursement report on Wednesday, August the 28th, as well as Nigeria's labor force report for the second quarter on Friday, August the 30th. And outside our shores, the U.S. Bureau of Economic Analysis will release the country's gross domestic product for the second quarter of the year on Thursday, August the 29th. And that's a wrap on business news. It's back to Melinda for the rest of the news at 10. Many thanks, Will. Time to cross over to our Buja studios where Terry Kumi is standing by with the latest from the world of sports. Welcome to Sports News. Uh, four days before the Paris 2024 Paralympic Games begin, the Paralympics flame has been lit next to the English hospital in Stoke Mandeville near London, where the idea for the competition was born. The Paralympic flame was then handed over to Tony Estangay, president of the Paris 2024 organizing committee, as it starts its journey to France. Around 4,400 athletes will compete in 549 events at this year's Paralympics. This flame there is a powerful message of peace, gathering and transmission and other strong values that have been conveyed thanks to the IPC for so many years, inspired by the first competitions that took place here in Stockmondeville with the vision of Sir Ludwig Goodman. 
For everyone involved in Paralympic movements, Tok Mandavi represents sacred and cherished ground. It is here, a little over 76 years that the, ago, that the visionary pioneer, Sir Ludwig Gutmann, created the Paralympic movement. I've seen firsthand the positivity and inspiration that the Paralympic Games can bring, not only to its participant athletes, the staff, the volunteers, but to the millions of viewers watching globally. Paralympic sport does have the ability to change perceptions and through sport inspire a better world for disabled people. In football, Nigeria's representatives, El Kanemi Warriors of Meduguri, have been eliminated from the CAF Confederation Cup by Daje of Benin Republic. Daje beat El Kanemi 2 1 to go through 3 2 on aggregate after both teams played out a 1 1 draw in Ikena a week ago. The Nigerian Federation Cup winners will shift attention to the Nigeria Premier Football League after gaining promotion last season. And in the English Premier League, Joe Pedro headed home a dramatic 95th minute winner for Brighton at the expense of Manchester United to win 2-1. West Ham returned to winning ways after beating Crystal Palace 2-0 at Sellost Park. Elsewhere, Nigeria's Alex Iwobi scored to give Fulham all three points in their first home game of the season as they defeated Leicester 2-1. Erling Haaland scored a hat-trick as Manchester City defeated Ipswich 4-1 in a comfortable victory at the Etihad Stadium. Nottingham Forest also secured a priceless 1-0 win against 1-0 away victory over Southampton, while Son Heung-min scored twice as Tottenham comfortably Prussia side a lackluster Everton side 4 0 to notch up their first Premier League win of the season. In the last game of the day, Arsenal beat Aston Villa 2 0 with goals from Leandro Trossard and Thomas Partey at Villa Park. Men's world number one Yannick Sinner has said that McLaren driver Leon Lando Norris claimed pole position for the Dutch Grand Prix peeping local favourite Max Verstappen into second in a thrilling qualifying season. The British driver registered the fastest lap in 1 minute 9.673 seconds ahead of Verstappen's Red Bull, who clocked 1 minute 10.029 seconds in windy and damp conditions on the Zandvoort circuit. Norris's McLaren teammate Oscar Piastri will start in third place on the grid on Sunday, ahead of George Russell from Mercedes in fourth. And that's it on Sports News. Back to you, Melinda. Many thanks, Terry. On the international scene, prosecutors in Italy have opened an investigation into the Sicily yacht disaster, stating that they are in the early stages of a so-called crime theory of culpable shipwreck and manslaughter, but no suspect has been identified or named just yet. They also say the boat likely sunk because of a downburst, which is a localized powerful wind that descends from a thunderstorm and spreads out. Italian authorities are holding a news conference after divers found the final missing person from the sinking of the luxury vessel. The body recovered is believed to be that of 18-year-old Hannah Lynch, the daughter of the British tech entrepreneur. Her father's body was recovered from the wreck on Thursday, along with four others. Police in Germany have begun a search for a suspect behind a mass stabbing after three people were killed and eight injured in the western German city of Thuringen. They say the motive for the attack is still not clear, but a large-scale manhunt for the perpetrator is on. Celebrations were underway to mark the 650th anniversary of the city's foundation festival of diversity when the incident occurred. And the main news again. Another massive flood has claimed 33 lives in Jigawa State, causing extensive damage and destruction across 14 local government areas of the state. And we also told you that the Director General of the NIA has tendered his resignation to President Bola Tinumbu at the Presidential Villa Abuja. That's the news at 10 tonight. I'm Melinda Kinlami. On behalf of the team, good night. Thank you.